Now, last week I covered a lot of material. Several people commented that it was really helpful, and I didn't have time last week to prepare any kind of notes. So this week I did. Is there anyone that did not pick up the notes from the back table? It's on a white sheet of paper. Anybody need that? Linda? Anybody else? Glenn, did you get one? <laughs> Carol, did you get one? Did you get one? Okay. There you go. All right. Now, last last week we, uh, if you look at page one of your notes there. Last week we made it down through the whole first section from Hebrews 1, so just to review a little bit. Uh, we talked about the fact that God communicates. He used to communicate through the prophets, now he's communicated in Christ. Because we're focusing on the preeminence of Christ. So he is the image of God. We talked about that, the importance of that truth, that he is the image of God. Um, he created time, he created the ages. He's the exact expression, number uh, number 11 there. Why does it go from 7 to 12 there? That's weird. It was right when I typed it, and the computer changed it. Well, what's with that? Okay. I was, I was looking at my spelling. I wasn't even paying attention to what numbers it put there. All right, so it starts with seven at the top there. That's not verse seven, that's just the numbering system the computer threw in there, okay? Okay, I'm awake now, here we go. Um, so we get down to, ver to number 11, I almost said verse 11. We get down to number 11 there under Hebrews one. And it says, he is the exact expression and the representation of God's essential substance. That's an important truth. God, Jesus Christ, there's, there's a debate going on even among evangelicals about the Trinity. Is there, is there just one, we know there is one God, but is there just one God with like three sort of manifestations? God is in the flesh sometimes when he's here as Christ. He's in a spirit when he's the Holy Spirit. It's just one God and they deny the Trinity. But the Bible talks about the Trinity as being three persons. I mean, it doesn't make sense that Jesus would pray to the Father if they were literally one person it's one God, so it's, it, and our mind can't wrap around this. We just have to take what the Bible says. So Jesus is praying to God the Father, and they are one in essence, they're one in substance, but they're not one in person. Otherwise, it would be no, make no sense for one to pray to himself and call him our Father when he's praying to himself. So, but the other, the other point is you have people like Jehovah's Witnesses who don't believe that Christ, he's a son of God in some way, but so are we in some way, they would say. And so uh, they deny the deity of Christ, that we don't go there either. And that's the point of this particular part, we're under the number 11 there in Hebrews 1, that Jesus is the same substance as the Father. He's, if you want to put it this way, made of the same stuff. Um, the last thing there under my strange numbering system, number 12, under Hebrews 1, it says, he upholds all things by his powerful word. Um, your numbers are right? Anybody else is wrong? <laughs> well, let's not get distracted by this. <laughs> I did do a split page, yeah. Okay, I did, I had the page all set up and I made a copy of it on another page so that they would be on front and back so I could cut them and the whole, the computer just made some decisions <laughs> on its own. All right. Under Colossians, can you find Colossians? Is that on everybody's paper? Yes. Colossians 1, that's where we were. So let's go there in our Bibles. And I don't know what your numbering system is. I'll help walk you through that. My numbering system's still wrong on that one, too. Uh, Colossians 1. So we were in Hebrews 1, and now we're in Colossians 1. 
Okay, Colossians 1. We're starting in verse 15. So let's pick up there again where we were last week. Colossians 1, 15. He, meaning Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So it says he's the image of God. That's a different word than what we talked about in Hebrews. This is the word icon. An icon, some churches have icons, which are like a picture or a statue. In computers, we have icons, which is a representation that we can see of something going on behind that in the computer. So he's a, the Greek word there is icon. He's the image of God in that sense. He's, what, he's the picture of God. The invisible God, God's invisible, but Jesus is the, is the human picture of, of God. Jesus told Philip, on my notes here, Jesus told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You remember Philip said, if you just show us the Father, that would be enough for us. We'd be happy with that. And Jesus said, well, you've seen me. You've seen me. And we talked a lot about 1 John 1, where John testified that he and the others had seen, heard, and touched the eternal life. He said that eternal life, which was with the Father, came here, and we, and that's an astonishing statement, actually, if you think about what it's saying. If you think about it, remember we started last week by talking about the fact that it, it's, Christianity has become kind of just a religion. And so we talk words, but we don't think about what we're saying sometimes. And John, the Apostle John, in writing 1 John, was making the claim that there's God there in heaven, and eternal life is with God, and he's making the claim in John, 1 John 1 that that eternal life came from heaven and came here. Now think about all the pagans and Greeks that were around him, or think about other Americans that we have around us, just regular, secular, atheistic, sort of naturalists. We're saying that the God of heaven came here. And we have people that wrote the Bible that said that they touched him, saw him, talked to him, interacted with him. So God came here, and these people interacted with him, and the disciples, John was an actual disciple, um, talked to him. I mean, John was sitting there next to Christ at the Last Supper, and he's saying that that was God sitting there next to him, and he was leaning against him during that, that meal. And so that's an amazing claim, um, because in, in those days, the Gnostics were a big... Um, philosophical group, and they didn't believe that the body was important at all, and God would certainly never come in a body, because bodies are bad, and God's spirit is good, and so they had this big debate going on. John said, no, God came here, he was in a body, I saw him, I talked to him, he had a mouth, he ate, he did things, he got his feet dirty, and he was here. And so that's what, that's what John is talking about there. So back to, back to Colossians. Um, in 15. He's the image of the invisible God. Verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. And so we kind of kidded about the all. All things, right? Everything. Everything that was created. And then this list is kind of amazing. First of all, visible and invisible things. Well, in science we have a lot of invisible things. A lot of visible things. But a lot of invisible things. You have to have a microscope. You have to have if you go down into the atom, there's a lot of invisible things. And Paul is writing here that, God, that Jesus made all of those things, the invisible things as well as the visible things. Um, whether thrones, so he made the thrones, he made the dominions. The, the dominion is the, is the authority to reign. The dominion is the rulership itself. He created the rulership, not just the rulers, but the rulership. Um, Principalities and powers. What are that? What's that? Principalities and powers. Human people that are in control, certainly, but it's, it's even bigger than that. Pardon? Some, not just the good things, but the bad things, because we we wrestle not against what, against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers. So in that particular verse, we're talking principalities and powers. We're talking about. Uh, Satan and his demons and all of the forces that are at work with him plus the system that he built and all of that. Well, what is this saying? By Christ, all things were created, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or principalities and powers. 
So he, cre he did God create, did Christ create Satan? Yeah. He wasn't Satan when he created him, but he created him, he created all the demons, he created all of that. Um, anything that exists, God created. And then he goes on to say, all things were created by him and for him. All things were created by him and for him. So when he says he created him, it for him, what does that mean? For, yeah, for himself. When you create something, some of you have hobbies where you create things. You may, you may be, uh, some of you ladies may have crafts that you do. Um, you know, some guys do woodworking or different things. When we create things, we say, I created this. I didn't create this to give away. I created this for myself. Is that a bad thing? No, you can, you can take stuff of the earth and make something for yourself. People do it all the time. Um, and what it's saying is God, Christ, created all of these things, and he did it for himself, for his own pleasure and for his own glory. He did it because he wanted to. He didn't need to. But all of these things he created uh, were created by Christ and for Christ. And so in, in your notes, whether it's, I don't know what number it is, and it's under Colossians 1. It's either a 2 or a 13. <laughs> It says he created, in my notes that I've got, he created everything that exists in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All right, and then there's a, there's a reference there to Nehemiah 9. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. So let me see, Nehemiah chapter 9. It's just a cross-reference here. Nehemiah chapter 9. Verse 4. 5 says, um, we got some names at the beginning of that, but then it says, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is called above, uh, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. So there's a, an acknowledgement in the Old Testament talking about God, and now the New Testament tells us that it was Christ that did that. That's who that is referring to, that made the heaven and the earth. So the preeminence of Christ, he created everything. Now back to Colossians 1. The next verse is kind of an amazing verse to me, verse 17, Colossians 1, 17. And he is before all things. Colossians 1, 17. He is before all things. I love languages, so that's kind of an interesting way to say that. We don't usually say something is before something else. You don't say, um, I can't even think of a good example because we never talk that way. You know, somebody somebody is, you talk about one of your children, and you might say in past tense, um, he could walk before he was, what, three or whatever you might say. Well, that's a past tense, isn't it? We don't say my son is walk. he's a 20-year-old son. He is walking before he's three. We don't talk, that's present tense, we don't use present tense. If, you see what I'm saying? But God, I mean Christ here, is, is, before everything. Well, what's, when, is, when was before everything? When, before the world was created, that's before. And Jesus is before. I'll let your mind think about that. He is before. Pardon? Yeah, what word does it use there? In the beginning was the word. This says he is before. That's right. What the, the point of this is that time doesn't matter. Je God says, I am that I am. I, and Jesus said, I am. Remember when he was talking to Pilate? I am. Um, he is. And, uh, time is nothing with God. Nothing. He is right now. He is before everything. And we think, well, how can that be? Well, because he's above all the time. He's, he sees it all as one big... One big uh, I used to, as a kid, I was trying to figure out how that would work. 
And I was fascinated by parades. Um, and some places you have, like, I used to march in the, in the uh, Christmas parade in Chicago. When I went to high school in Chicago, I, we were in the I was in the band. And, and that's a, the State Street Christmas parade is a big thing, you know. And so it was a long, long parade, and we marched in that. But so then I would think, even as a teenager, I can remember thinking that the, um, when people were watching the parade, people that were toward the beginning of the parade would see the beginning part of it, you know, and whatever was, was coming down the road right then. But the people that were 12 blocks down, they, it hadn't even started yet. I mean, they were still walking across the street to finding something to drink and telling their kids to be careful and all that stuff. Nothing was happening there. And as the parade moved, then those people eventually got what these people had a while back. You see what I'm saying? Uh, to me, that, as a kid, that's the kind of the way I pictured time. Because if you were up in the top of a tall building or in a helicopter or something, you could see the whole parade from the beginning to the end. And that's the way I kind of pictured God with time. We're just kind of marching along through time, and God sees the beginning, and he sees the end, and it's all the same to him. It doesn't matter. He's not, he's not down in there where the progression of stuff is going by. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but that's what I thought when I was like 15. Okay, so he is before all things. And then what does the next part of that phrase say? He is before all things. And all things what? Consist. All things consist. We talked a little bit about this last week because it mentions it in Hebrews too. All, also, he... All things consist, hold together. Jesus Christ holds everything together. The reason the world isn't flying apart physically and blowing up is because he's holding it together. He's actively doing that by his word. It says in another passage that he does that by his word. So his word has not only created the world and created everything in it, but it holds it all together as well. And verse 18 of Colossians 1 says that, he is the head of the body, the church. It was the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So he's the one that holds it all together. He's the one that's the um, head of the church. He has the preeminence in everything. Everything. Not just religious stuff, not just church stuff, but he has the preeminence in everything. Verse 19 for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. I mean, in my Bible, I've drawn a big arrow. It's all on the same page on my Bible, over to chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. And I, so I, it's all on the same page on my Bible, so I have an arrow drawn from verse 19 of chapter 1 over to verse 9 of chapter 2. In verse 9 of chapter 2, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now try to grasp that one. I'm just asking you to, to think about some of these things because they kind of expand our understanding of God. It says, in him, in Christ, first of all, at night, verse 19 says, it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. In Christ all fullness should dwell. So that pleased the Father, that's what he wanted. That was his pleasure, to have all the fullness dwell in Christ. And verse 9 of chapter 2 says, explains that a little bit more. It says, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. All of deity, the entirety of deity dwells in Christ. So when Christ was walking around on the earth, the entire deity of, Christ, of, the, of the Godhead is in, is in Christ. And it pleased the Father that that would be the way it was. All the, the fullness. So what can we say? What can we say about the deity of Christ? Well, all these different examples. He's the essence of God's nature. He's one with God the Father. He, every part of the deity dwells in Christ. He is God. He is God. And on the back side of that page now, uh, I have a reference to a couple of other passages in Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 22. In 23, it says, and he put all things under his feet. God did put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which we just talked about in Colossians also, which is his body, 
the fullness of him who fills all in all. So there's another, that's kind of a cross-reference. He's the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now here's the astounding one. If you turn to chapter 3, verse 19 of Ephesians. He's talking about, in chapter 3, verse 18, he's talking about comprehending with all the saints what's the length and width width and breadth and depth of the love of God. Verse 19, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. And look at the last phrase. Pardon? Yeah, look at the last, look at what it says. Who, who is going to be filled with the fullness? Who? Yeah. It says you, right? That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? And here he's saying, I want you to understand that when you become a Christian, God comes and dwells in you too. You're not God, like Christ is God. But we have, we have access to God. He comes and lives in us. We say we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's God too, right? And so we have God living in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have all kinds of expressions like that in Scripture. We, when we walk around here on this earth, getting dust on our feet and all of those things, we also are in, indwelt by God. We are children of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. And we're filled with all the fullness of God. Um, I mean, that's Paul's prayer here in Ephesians. And that, to me, that's an amazing thing to think about. Back to Colossians 1. Back to Colossians 1. And verse 20. By him, by Christ, to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So what's the ministry of Christ in that verse? ministry of Christ and the reason he is the, has preeminence in everything is because he reconciles everything to himself. In the end, um, everything's going to be brought together in Christ, and when, um, when all the enemies have been defeated, the last enemy to be, to be defeated is going to be what? In 1 Corinthians 15, anybody know? Death. Death is the last enemy to be defeated, and it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that when all things, all, he has brought all the enemies under his feet, the last enemy is death, then he's going to turn the whole thing back over to the Father, and God will be all in all. That's kind of the wrap-up of the whole story of the Bible. Um, Colossians 1.20, which is where we are, by him to reconcile all things by, to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, you, we, who were once alienated and enemies in our mind by wicked works, yet now he's reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So he's reconciled us too. He's reconciling everything to himself, including us. I thought it's interesting in do you know what a creed is? Some churches say a creed, like the Apostles' Creed, or if you look at 1 Timothy 3.16, I think that's kind of a creed. 1 Timothy 3.16. In fact, my Bible has it kind of separated out from the rest of the text. 1 Timothy 3.16 kind of summarizes what we've talked about here. Um, 1 Timothy 3.16 Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And now, he got, now you get to the creed. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. It's kind of a, it'd be a worth memorization package right there. God was manifested in the flesh in the person of Jesus, correct? God was manifested in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. 
Um, did Christ need justification? Not really. He was just, but he's the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit justified Christ in the sense not not to make him righteous, but declared him to be righteous, who he is. And seen by angels. When did angels see Jesus? Probably after his resurrection, and at, probably at his birth too, they were around. And then, of course, while he was in heaven, they, he was with angels all the time. He was preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. People have believed on Christ, and he was received up into glory. So there's kind of a, a creed that's worth memorizing. All right, so we looked at Hebrews 1. We looked at Colossians 1. Now let's go to John 1. John 1. In the beginning, you know this passage well, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we've talked about this a little bit in the past. The word, the Greek word there is logos. But what I, realized, what I realized a few years ago when I was kind of thinking about this and trying to figure out what the Greek people believed, not the Christians, but just the Greek people, because I'm interested in languages, as I've said. Um, usually the word logos in the Bible is translated as word. But in their philosophies of that day, outside of the Bible, I'm not, right now I'm not talking about the Bible, what did those people mean when they talked about logos, when they talked among themselves? You remember how the Apostle Paul talks about in, in Acts how the people in, in like Corinth had nothing better to do than stand around and talk about stuff, you know? And when they used the word logos, they didn't just mean word. They used logos when they wanted to use the word word. You know, look at all the words in the newspaper that use the word logos for that. But what they meant by that was the divine reason. When, the, when you look at the universe, when you look at, I haven't looked at the pictures, right, but there's some new telescope out. Have you seen the pictures of that? There's some new telescope that they've just um, shown pictures from. And I need to look at that because I'm interested in all that stuff. But th there's just fantastic pictures. And every Christian I've seen who's posted any of those pictures on the internet talks about the creative ability of God. The firmament shows his handiwork, and we're going to look at that passage in just a minute. But you look out there, you look at trees, you look at animals, you look at people, and the, the structure of our bodies, the way the seasons work, um, it all looks like a well-running machine of some kind. And even non-believing scientists will use words that they accidentally use. They will say that part of the body was designed to do such and such. Or even when they're talking about some some dumb little insect thing, you know, that the stinger on that bee is designed, it's got a snap like a like a what is it, like a mouse trap or something, you know, and it's designed to throw that stinger in there and I say that because I was stung this week. Um, I could feel two things. One was when the thing went in and I go, oh what was that? I thought I bumped into a stick. I was riding my mower. And then there was the, the split second after that when there was the inje injection of one minor, one small, tiny little bit of something. It's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> that hurt. Um, so when scientists talk about stuff like that, if you were a studier of bees, then it, these people say things like, that's designed so that when the bee touches you, it springs that, you know, well, designed? I thought we were evolutionists. What's with design? You know, they can't help themselves but use those kind of words because what we see out there, there's a, there's a wisdom, there's intelligence behind it, there's all of that. And so what the Greeks used, the word they used for that was logos. When they talked about the fact that the beast thing was, had a design to it, they talked about the logos that's out there. It's the, from the Encyclopedia Britannica, they say it's the divine reason, implicit, Implicit means in, inside, the cosmos, ordering it, and giving it form and meaning. So it's obvious that there's something there just besides the physical world. Everybody acknowledges that. 
Now, I got to thinking about that passage in Psalm 19 that we know really what pretty well. Let's turn there. Does this to me, and while you're turning there, let me say this. I think the Holy Spirit had John, we believe in the verbal inspiration of Scripture, correct? So when John was writing John 1, he used the word logos, which is what people were talking about on the streets and wherever they were in those days. And they meant more than just the word. So when you translate it into English, you need a word for there, so they used the word word. But the Greeks would understand more than just the word word. They would understand that cosmic sort of meaning that's in the universe, I think. And so when John says, in the beginning, there was that, that intelligence, that designer's idea in the universe, and he's letting people know that was in the beginning with God. And you know what? It was God. And you know what? That thing that you guys call the Logos came here and lived among us. I think that's what he's saying in John 1. But look at chapter 19 of Psalm. Psalms. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. Declare. Okay? What kind of word is declare? When, when something declares something, what do you expect to happen? If in a book it says, there's a couple of blanks, blank, declared, that, and a bunch of other blanks. What do you think is happening there? Pardon? He's, he's telling something. And he's, if he's telling something, he's probably using words. Right? Or writing words. So-and-so declared in an article, or so-and-so declared from the platform, from the podium, you expect them to be using words. So the heavens declare the glory of God. There's words. Even though we don't hear those words with our physical ear, there's words there. It's talking to you. You say, well, I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. All right, let's go on. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Next verse. Day unto day utters light. What? Speech, day unto day, the firmament and the heavens are uttering speech. All day long, they're uttering speech. Speech sounds to me like words. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There's knowledge. Knowledge is information. There's information coming from the firmament and the handiwork. Um, so is it coming in English, Spanish? What's it coming in? Verse 3, there is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. So is it just in America where the speech is coming from the firmament and the heavenly stuff? Is it just in America? No, we speak English, and we get it in English. But there is no language where it's not heard. So if you speak Swahili or wherever you are, it's coming to you too, Spanish. French, wherever you are, it's coming to you. Everybody hears it. Everybody hears it. Their line has gone out throughout the earth, and their words to the end of the world. All over the world, this knowledge, this speech from the heavens declaring the glory of God are portrayed, are given out. Now, to me, I never put that together with John 1 before. But that speech coming in the beginning was the word, and the Greeks were using that Logos word to mean exactly what Psalm 19 is saying. They looked out there, and they could hear it talking in their, in their spirit. They could hear it talking. They knew there was a divine something going on. They didn't know about the God of the Bible necessarily, but there's, it's talking. The universe is talking. And the deeper you go in science, the more it talks. Because how can these forces be that do what they do? And all of that is just amazing. And you would think that the deeper somebody got into their specialty in science, the more they would believe in God. You would think that. Because it's not just we have eyes, but our eyes have 
lenses and they have sensory things to open and close our pupils and all of that stuff like on a camera. How often, how long did it take them to figure out on a camera how to put the electronic chips in it so you didn't have to do your own thing with the camera lens that to make it wider? It'd be, I mean, we put a lot of thought into all of that, how we're going to create all that stuff. And yet all our eyes just kind of developed over millions of years and we just kind of, it's just there. If you go out into a forest and you're on a hike kind of along in the forest and you come upon a circle of approximately the same size stones in a big circle, maybe a foot and a half, two feet in diameter, almost a perfect circle, maybe not quite, what do you think? Pardon? Somebody put them there. Years ago there was a fire there. They, I mean, they had a little campfire or something. That's a simple little thing. And yet you don't think, oh my goodness, after all these years, there's a circle of rocks here. Now there are some places where those things happen. You get certain kind of forces underneath with some water and it's, you know, but we, all, we always think people when we see something like that. But so the scientists look at us and they go, oh yeah, evolution, yeah. It doesn't make any sense. So now go to Romans 1. Sometime I hope to have a series on Romans 1 or 2. How did we get into the mess we're in in this world right now? Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So what people do is they suppress the truth. Romans 1, 18. What does this have to do with Psalm 19 and our talk today? What does this have to do with it? Look at verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. The them is all the people in the world who have ever lived. What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world... So that's back at Adam and Eve. Since the creation of the world, his, God's, invisible attributes are, what's the next couple words? Clearly, not foggily, clearly, clearly seen. Well, how can that be? Since the creation of the world, God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by what? The things that are made. Think Psalm 19. All this speech is coming down, 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 down constantly, day and night in every language of the world. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, four-footed animals, creeping things, and so forth. And then you have the whole cycle going downhill after that. So sometimes people struggle. Sometimes people struggle with the idea, for example, that there can be some people on the earth in some island somewhere, or even in America somewhere, where they never, ever hear the gospel and how can God hold them accountable for that? And why can, how can they be guilty? How can they go to hell just because they haven't heard of Christ? Well, we have the whole idea of original sin. That's one thing. But here is what it tells us. Every person sees this knowledge. It's coming constantly, day and night, day and night, day and night. And God says it's clear. It's clear. And what do people do with that knowledge? They suppress it. They don't want to be answerable to a God. Because God might ask us to do certain things or forbid us from doing certain things. So we don't want to answer to that God. And so what people naturally do is they suppress it. And Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 1 that that makes everyone guilty. Whether you've heard the gospel or not, doesn't matter. Everyone is guilty. So even somebody who dies without ever hearing the gospel is still guilty of sinning against God because they've taken the knowledge that's clear, God says it's clear, and they've suppressed it. They don't want to deal with it. And God says that's a crime against him. Instead of giving him glory and praising him and saying, wow, you are an amazing God that made all this stuff. Who are you and what are you doing? And 
you know, giving him some credit and glory for what he's done. Um, we suppress the truth. Um, so people don't need, people get second chances. We all get to, we've all gotten a chance to hear the gospel. But we don't necessarily, it isn't necessarily required that we have that chance because God could have thrown the whole thing out in the first place. You know, he, he didn't have to put up with all this rebellion that we have uh, sent his way. So I just thought that was interesting that Psalm 19 talks about the message coming out. Romans 1 talks about the fact that we've seen it, we know it, it's clear. The language is in all languages of the world, and so then there, there's no excuse. That's why everybody's lost. That's why we have to get the gospel out. Because the same God that created all that stuff provided a way of escape, didn't he? Through Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth today. And, um, we're grateful for your preserving your word for us so that we can, we can learn and grow and know who you are and know what you've done to, to provide salvation for us. We're grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was going to make one announcement. I